What would you do if you had the opportunity to interview Jesus? Pilate did. When Pilate was questioning Jesus, he asked, what is truth? Pilate never stuck around for the answer, but that should not stop us. We in our day can ask Christ the same question, what is truth? And go to the word of God for our answer. The Pilot's Interview podcast will investigate the truths of the Word of God and host interviews or discussions with theologians, pastors, and historians. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today we have the honor of hosting Calvin Smith. Calvin is the Executive Director of Answers in Genesis, Canada. He has been involved in apologetics and defending the Christian faith for two decades, and he's penned dozens of apologetic articles, produced numerous video presentations, and has given lecture speaking events, all defending God's Word from the very first verse. Calvin specializes in Christian ministry, apologetics, and theology, and understanding, explaining, and defending the biblical worldview and on affirming biblical authority. You can find more of Calvin Smith's materials on the AnswersInGenesis.ca website. And be sure to subscribe to the Answers in Genesis Canada YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, good morning, Calvin. How was your day, and how are you doing? Good morning, brother. No, having a good day. Yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks for me, but uh, finally getting a little more settled. So thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you on, Calvin. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 8 through 9, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing forward or perverse in them. They're all plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. May you plainly tell us, is theistic evolution a biblical position? Well, that's a, that's a good word. You know, I, I like the, how it says plainly, um, you know, that, that word. And of course, when we are presenting the apologetic for biblical creation, um, we always say we don't take the Bible literally, like wooden literalism. We always say we take the Bible as plainly written. What, what's it meant to convey to the audience, of, you know, as the author meant it to, to convey? And so asking the question is um, is theistic evolution, uh, basically that's what it is. They're trying to kind of make it a little more friendly here by saying, uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, evolutionary creationism or something like that now. Um, is No, it, it is not a biblical position. And, and I'll, I'll use an example. You see, many times when we're out speaking, Christians will say, look, you know, Bible-believing Christians of, of all s- sorts and stripes, you know, we have all these denominational issues. Some people believe this about soteriology. Some people believe that. Some people believe this about end times. Some people believe this about baptisms and, and stuff. And we're all believers and we all, you know, should just get along. And, then, you know, that, that's fine. We can have these different stances. But um, th- here's the difference. If, if I was to sit down with a group of pastors, okay, of all different stripes, and each one of them, you know, everything's fine for 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden the distinctives start coming out. What each one of those men would do, okay, is they would take out their Bible and they'd say, yeah, but look at this verse here. And then someone else would say, yeah, but look at this Bible verse here. And they would be discussing their distinctives, all pointing to scripture. What we deal with in the Answers in Genesis ministry is many Christians who are saying, yeah, but my, my, my uh, Bible, you know, Bible college professor or my, my science teacher or my, you know, when I was in school, they said that the earth's billions of years old and, uh, you know, evolution is a fact. Well, you're not pointing at scripture. All of those ideas are extra biblical. You don't find them in scripture. So when people are asking, is theistic evolutionary, it's, it's not a biblical position. I don't care what your, your stance is on baptism. I, I, I know the arguments. I know the verses you're going to go to, but you're going to go to verses. Please show me. This is what I like to ask people who believe in evolution in millions of years. Could you name me your top three Bible verses that convinced you that God used billions of years to create? Because it's a real short list because there are none. (laughs) And so, no, theistic evolution is not a biblical position. What it is, is it's an attempt to shoehorn the story of evolution into scripture somewhere and, you know, basically turn Genesis into a myth. But um, 
there's some real challenges with that. And we're seeing it played out in society right now. So, for example, whether you're talking about the gender issue or traditional marriage or all these things, I mean, you can quote Jesus, you know, when Jesus says, well, have you not read that in the beginning God created male and female? But who, what's Jesus quoting? He's quoting from Genesis. And so for all the pastors and theologians and Bible college professors and all these people waxing eloquently about how somehow we can synchronistically, you know, uh, shoehorn evolution into, into Genesis, um, they have no defense right now. With, with this, you know, tsunami of this whole gender issue that's that's hitting the church right now. There, there is no defense if you've already given that up. Um, and that's the, that's the real unfortunate part of it. Wow. And so just kind of a follow-up question on that. This isn't in the script, but would you say that giving up the authority of Genesis sort of opened the floodgates for all of these things? Well, absolutely. I mean, I grew up uh, as an atheist. Uh, my parents weren't Christians. I went to school. I loved dinosaurs. I loved, you know, I, I we did a lot of traveling. My, my dad was, uh, he was involved in mineral exploration and stuff. So we lived all over the world. And every time I went to a new school, I just remember, you know, going to the library and digging out dinosaur books and all that. I, I just love that stuff. And so I very much accepted the, the whole story of evolution. I could teach evolution, um, <laughs> you know, on a basic level. Um, and so, so yeah, to me growing up, when I encountered Christians, and, you know, they would be, I, I don't mean like I was a Richard Dawkins atheist. I would just live my life that way. And they'd say, hey, Cal, you want to go to a Bible study? And, no. Hey, hey, you want to go to church? No. Like in my mind, I was like, why, why would I do that? I already know where we came from. You know, uh, this is just whatever. If you're into it, great. But if they persisted, then, you know, I'd get a little salty and I'd be like, look, you really believe this book? You, you believe some guy got two of every animal on a boat and there are millions of species of animals on the planet? Must have been a big boat, eh? You really think we came from two people? Where did all the races come from? We all come from two people. Like, I, it was kind of funny because I didn't go to church um, or anything like that. But through osmosis, like, I kind of collect these things to attack the Bible, even though I hadn't read the Bible. But they all stem from Genesis. The same questions that I answer now in apologetics conferences are the tools that I was using against uh, Christians. It's quite funny with the way the Lord works, of course. And... The typical response I would get from the majority of Christians when I would hit them with these questions is they would simply run away. They didn't have an answer for their face. First Peter 3.15, they must not have read the verse, whatever. The second most common response I would get is, you know, they would say, oh, you know, I'd say, what about the big boat and the animals? They'd say, well, you know, this is probably just, you know, an analogy and probably just a teaching lesson. And I'd be like, yeah, well, the story about the dead guy coming back to life, that's probably an analogy too, right? And then they would run away, right? Because I was being logically consistent. I was just being, I was the average dude going, hey, how do you explain the Bible, uh, Christian? And they didn't have an answer for their faith. It seems so illogical to me. I mean, the Big Bang, you know, we've got cosmic evolution, and then you've got, you know, geological evolution, and then you've got chemical evolution, you've got biological evolution, you've got human evolution. Boom, there, there's the whole package. Why do I need God? And so, yes, the answer to that question is when you give up the authority of the Bible in Genesis, which is the seedbed of all Christian doctrines, all Christian doctrines directly or indirectly are founded in the book of Genesis. And when you give that up and you say, well, no, you know, the world has the explanations now as to, you know, cosmology and biology and geology and all these kind of things. Um, then you have handed that authority over. And then anytime you try to quote scripture, it's logical for the opponent to then say, well, you don't take this part as plainly written. Why do you take this part as plainly written? And I discuss this with Christians all the time, and they don't have a hermeneutic. They don't have a logical, consistent uh, way to interpret scripture. It's, it's what my friend here in Canada, Joe Boot, he's an apologist. He, he's a British guy. He calls it pick and mix, pick and mix theology. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I don't know what you got, bits and bites. That's what we call it in Canada. You know, where you like this part and you like that part. And, and it's just not consistent. It's not logical. It's not rational. And to be honest, that's the way I considered Christians when I was growing up. I considered them irrational people. I considered them, you know, they're nice people. I mean, you want to have them next door neighbors. They're always friendly and smiley. And, you know, somebody gets sick, the lady's bringing over a casserole. And, you know, they're nicey, nice people and stuff like that. 
But on a basic level, like, did they not get science? I mean, come on, what are, what are, what are they going to these buildings for? And hallelujah, hallelujah. It didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So that's just my experience. But I've talked to hundreds of people that were very much in the same camp. And I still engage with atheists um, that are just there as well. So, yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for sort of just sharing your testimony. I remember I had a similar question myself when I was younger. I was in Sunday school and I wanted to know, well, I mean, there's a lot of animals. So how did Noah get them all on the ark? And then the answer was, you see this celery? Right? So we got some celery here. We're going to put some peanut butter on that celery, right? right? See, now we put the peanut butter on the celery. We're going to take some raisins. We're going to sprinkle those raisins on the celery. That's Noah's Ark. Eat this and stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was their apologetic thing. Yeah. You know, I don't think that adults give young people, I'm talking little kids, the, you know, they don't give them the respect intellectually that they, they deserve. Because kids have these questions and you'd better start teaching them apologetically at a very young age because they want answers, right? It's that, that they want to know how everything's working and they love things like dinosaurs. And sure, Noah's Ark is an engaging story. But as soon as you start thinking beyond the little, you know, bathtub ark and the giraffe sticking out the top and there's never any dinosaurs on there and you start down, I mean, the average nine, 10 year old, um, I believe I could have challenged many Christians as a 10 year old just by asking them questions about science and dinosaur. And because I was getting all these accolades, right? I could say Brachiosaurus and I could say Ankylosaurus and I could say Triceratops and I could say, you know, Diplodocus. I could say, and, and I, all these Latin names and, and adults were like, wow, you're really smart and, and all this kind of stuff. But I was accumulating this narrative. I was, accum okay, how did we get here? Oh, Big Bang. Okay, so that was how it started. Like I wanted to know, and all kids do, so yeah, that was that's a pretty poor apologetic. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the quicker answer is that God sent kinds of animals to Noah, not all of the various species that have happened and occurred from those kinds. There's a dog kind, but we have all sorts of variations of dogs. Uh, we have the elephant kind, we have all sorts of variations, but in the beginning, God created kinds of creatures that have diversified through things like natural selection and you know mutations and, and so on like that. But uh, he only needed kinds on the ark. That would be a much quicker and easier thing, I think, even for a young person to grasp. Like, see all these different kinds of dogs? Yeah, you can get variations of dogs. But you know what they will only ever reproduce is dogs. They don't turn into anything else. So, anyway. I should have had you as my Sunday school teacher then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know something, though? Since we're on the subject of, like, biblical teaching, biblical apologetics, I, I would like to go to the second question. So, from the first question... It basically sounds like you're saying that you don't really see theistic evolution or, as they call it now, evolutionary creation as being a biblical position. Now, there are some Christians who would disagree with you on that. So there's an organization, they're called BioLogos. They claim that the Bible is a reliable source of knowledge about God and spiritual things. However, the Bible is not, they say, a reliable source of of scientific knowledge about the origin of the earth and the universe, including living things, because it was never intended to teach us about science. Furthermore, they argue, the creation story of Genesis 1 is a confession of faith in the true creator intended to refute pantheism and polytheism, not to tell us how God actually created the world. Calvin, what do you think of these claims? Is scientific evidence irrelevant to the Bible? And are the early passages of Genesis simply theological triasties instead of historical records? You know, it's, it's always interesting when I hear Christians make these claims because what they're actually saying is they have a special knowledge of how to understand this area of Scripture, where for centuries, um, Christians just looked at Genesis the way they looked at the rest of the Bible. But now it's almost like there's this Gnostic knowledge that they've come upon that, you know, well, now that we've discovered evolution, now we know how to interpret the Bible. And again, what you're doing is you're handing the authority over because you're saying, no, there isn't a way to, to interpret scripture until the scientists come along and tell us about evolution. And we didn't know all these things and, and, and so on. It's like, where did they get the authority to make those claims about God's word? Because if Jesus is saying, but have you not read that from the beginning of the creation, God created the male and female? 
This is Jesus speaking, right? Uh, Jesus is God. Uh, he only said, it actually says in, in, in John, the Gospel of John, that he only says what the Father's told him to say. I mean, is Jesus lying? Is, is God the Father telling Jesus while he's here on earth to say incorrect things? Um, you know, when the, when the New Testament writers write that there was a, a global flood, which theistic evolutionists would deny, there was never a global flood. Um, because that involves science, by the way. If you're going to have a global catastrophe, it's going to completely reshape the geology of the planet. You'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in sedimentary rock, which is exactly what we find. Um, and, and so they're making all these, these uh, claims about authority and what, what the Word of God says and all these things. You know, one of the statements you said was something to the effect of, well, what Genesis is telling us about is God the creator and it fights against pantheism and all these, these, these things. And it, maybe it does. I, I'm, I, of course it does. It's the one creator God, like Paul, when he goes up to the Areopagus, he's like, I want to talk to you about this, the creator God he created the heavens and the earth. He created everything, right? But if you're telling me that that's the authority that you're trying to establish, but God, you know, he just used these, these, the, the six days and all this kind of stuff. It's like, it's like when I have theistic evolutionists say, well, you know, these simple Jewish people, they just wouldn't have understood the sophisticated story of evolution. I'm like, well, let, let's try this out because they do it in kindergarten class in state-run schools all over the world. How about this? In the beginning, God created the first living thing. And that first living thing changed slowly and eventually became all the living things that have ever been. That'd be pretty simple to say, wouldn't it? it would, would people be confused? Like if God had written that down, would the Israelites have been like, duh, I just I don't get it. You know, like it's such a simple concept that God could have said, and yet he wraps it in this narrative, day one, day two, day three, day four, everything he does, specifics. You know, I hear people say, well, it's not about how God created, it's just that he did create. Well, then why all the specificity? Why all the, the exact detail, you know? And, and, and so it becomes this rambling, goofy story. It's kind of like, here's a simple analogy. You know, we have, I don't know what you got down there, Craigslist or whatever. We got Kijiji. And, and if you were looking for a new car, a new vehicle, and you came across my ad and I said, hey, I got a, a 2018 Honda Civic. It's red. Uh, and it's got uh, 22,000 kilometers on it and X amount of dollars. And then when you showed up, uh, well, actually, it was a, a blue Toyota and it had 210,000 clicks on it. And I wanted a lot more money. And I, I would be like, well, you know, it's, it's generally the same thing. I mean, you've got four wheels. It, it kind of gets you from point A to point B. It's, you know, how much would you trust me? It these are all such common sense things. I'll tell you what I, I believe the enemy is so good at today is the whole concept of intellectualism uh, today is, well, we, we, we just need to discuss these things. We, you don't have to accept them. But let's just discuss. Let's discuss whether Adam was a real person or not. It's like for 2000 years, the church seemed to get it right. You know, the Jews didn't seem to be confused as Adam was the first man, Eve was the first woman. Uh, they just believed what Paul said from from one man. He created all nations of men. You know, all the, all these these verses that are so plainly uh, written. And now you get all this verbiage and this garbage and all that that kind of stuff. And eventually, I think that many many Bible college students are just basically like, well, the Bible can mean anything you want it to. And if the Bible can mean anything you want it to, then it has no authority. And, and why are we listening to it anyway, right? And I think that's really been the, the attack and the collapse. So they can make all these claims, but Jesus doesn't support them. The disciples, as a matter of fact, think of it this way. If you never had the Old Testament, you just had one of these Gideon Bible things, you know, where you got the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, and you wanted to know about the creation of the earth, guess what you'd find out by just reading the New Testament? That God created one man, his wife was named Eve. Uh, uh, that, that's where all people came from. There was a global flood, eight people survived. You'd know all of that just from the New Testament, that God created male and female in the beginning. You'd know all of that. And so if the New Testament is reiterating the Old Testament and, and reinforcing it, 
But the Old Testament is basically mythological. You know, here, here's another thing to consider. The biblical timeline. If you go from today to when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry, you've got roughly 2,000 years, right? And that's not recorded in the Bible. We've got Acts, and the, you know, the, the New Testament. But most of that's not recorded in Scripture. If you go from the time of Jesus' earthly ministry to Abraham, you've got about 2,000 years, roughly. And even secular archaeologists will, and, you know, will say, yeah, there was a guy named Abraham lived about 2,000 B.C. And then if you add up the chronogenealogies in the Old Testament, which, by the way, they're not like the New Testament uh, chronologies, which have gaps, and we know that. The Old Testament chronologies are very tight. This man lived this long, and at this age, he had a son. Now, whether that was a son, grandson, adopted son, it doesn't matter, because he lived this long, and at this point, he had a son who lived this long, and at this point, he had a... So it, it's tight. You've got roughly 2,000 years to the creation. So roughly 6,000 years, that's why we, we always say that. Now... There's only 4,000 years recorded in scripture, roughly. A full 50% of the time recorded in the Bible is from Genesis 1 to 11. 50% of the recorded time in scripture is Genesis 1 to 11, and you've got the majority of people like biologists and theistic evolutionists telling people that that's mythology. Then they're coming along and they're telling people, but we want you to believe the other 50% of the time in the Bible. Why? Am I really supposed to believe? Okay, so I'm not going to believe Genesis because science, right? But I'm going to believe that a donkey talked. I'm going to believe that axe heads float. I'm going to believe that, you know, dead people come back to life. I'm going to believe that crippled hands get healed instantaneously. Water into wine. Walking on water, it's not even frozen. You know, at what point am I supposed to be ashamed of the Bible? That, that's what I would like to ask my theistic evolutionary friends that are just bowing down to secular science saying, well, science says, yeah, well, science says dead people don't come back to life. And science says donkeys don't talk. So as a Christian, I have a supernatural worldview. Jesus is the creator. He created everything. You can read it in the book of Colossians. So if he gave us that really bad information in the beginning, and he couldn't even explain that in the beginning, God created over vast periods of time, and he created the first thing, and it changed. It, it would have been so easy for him to say. Nobody would have been confused. And uh, by the way, it's pagans who believed in evolutionary ideas. So if Genesis was written to show people that to, to move them away from paganism by writing a creation story that showed his incredible, uh, you know, power and creativity to show them that no evolutionary ideas didn't happen, but really he did use evolutionary ideas. And we've just found about it now. It, it, it's, it's in my estimation, it's absolute foolishness. And, and they're just buying this, this line. So I would really encourage people to understand there are robust scientific uh, explanations for the things that, that these people are, are, are just saying, well, we've got to accept this because of science. No, we have a, a team of scientists, PhDs that, uh, you know, have some very, very uh, solid evidence in support of scripture. But having said that, I think scripture should be our first line of defense anyway. Uh, it's great that we, we, sure, what would you expect from a great flood, billions of dead things buried in rock? Great. That supports what the Bible says, but I'm going with the Bible first approach anyway. Because I can't, I can't prove to you that Jesus rose from the dead. I can't do that. There's no scientific experiment. I can do that. I just accept on faith. Why wouldn't I accept all of God's word on faith? I have to say that before we go to the next, you had like a real mic drop there. You know, at what point are Christians supposed to be ashamed of the Bible? That was an amazing quote. Well, I mean, this is the way the liberals operated, right? They, 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 they said this is mythology, and then they just kept moving, 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 moving. And now you've got half of the Church of England that says, well, Jesus was really born of a virgin. And you got half the church saying, well, no, Mary was probably raped by a Roman soldier. So, you know, it, I mean, wh where does it stop? There is no line um, in the sand once you've, you've given up biblical authority. That's the, that's the real challenge. That is incredible. You know... There are a diversity of views, and even though these many people who have these different views will, will still claim that they are standing on authority of the Bible. So, for example, I'm going to quote Biologos again. 
They say evolutionary creationists, or ECs, have diverse views on many biblical and scientific questions. Consider Adam and Eve. ECs generally agree that people were made by God and that humans are biologically related to other creatures. But they differ on how best to interpret the early chapters of Genesis. Some ECs believe Adam and Eve were a historical couple. Others see the story as a symbolic retelling of Israel's story, or as a symbolic story about humanity as a whole. Many interpretations have been put forward, and this remains an exciting area of scholarship. So, Calvin, does the Bible teach that Adam and Eve were symbolic representations of Israel or of humanity, that they were a historical couple, or any other sort of interpretation? Short answer is no. They don't. Uh, that, that's, again... See, I always encourage people, why don't you go look up Bible commentaries like before, let's say, 1830? You know, when, when Charles Lyell really started taking Hutton's ideas and promoting the concept of ancient earth. And then, of course, Darwin, you know, read Lyell's book and really started to see biology through the lens of billions of years and, and stuff and then gradual change and stuff. Go look up Bible commentaries before that. Um, guess what? You don't find gap theory. You don't find theistic evolution. You don't find age theory. You don't find framework hypothesis. You don't find that stuff. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of church fathers and the reformers believed in Genesis as plainly written. Six day, young earth creation, all that stuff. Now you're going to have listeners that are listening in on this and they're going to, something's going to pop into their mind right away. They're going to say, well, Augustine didn't believe in, in young earth creation, you know, and stuff like that. I encourage you to go look up Augustine's writings because sure, he, he allegorized the days, right? So he thought that God had created it in an instant because God's God, he's just boom. And that he, the days were allegory, but look up how old he thinks the earth is. It's less than 6,000 years old. So Augustine was actually a young earth creationist. The only point of difference between someone like myself and Augustine was that I don't believe the days were allegorical. Um, he just had that kind of impression in his head. Why? Why? It was just a thought he had because the Bible doesn't indicate that there were allegory or anything like that. Exodus 20, 11, for in six days, the Lord created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's the reason why we have a six-day work week and rest on the seventh, Exodus 20, 11. So, you know, and they might point out like origin or, you know, there's a couple of, of, uh, of the church fathers. But the vast majority, I'm talking like 90, 98, 99% of the church fathers and just the average lay Christian. Matter of fact, something your listeners might want to check out is if you go to the Answers in Genesis, uh, .ca, or Answers in Genesis Canada uh, YouTube channel, Look up one of the videos I did called Defining Genesis. And what it was is an exploration of the, uh, the original Webster's Dictionary. Because I, I, what inspired it is I had a theistic evolutionist challenge me on Facebook and said, oh, well, you know, young earth creation is a modern thing. The, 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 you know, the church fathers never thought of Genesis as, as literal. And, and so, you know, instead of just quoting the, you know, Luther and Calvin and, and all these guys that we've done millions of times, um, I thought, oh, this will be a different take because this is the 1928 Webster's Dictionary. And when you go through the dictionary, you'll read that Adam was a, a, the first man. Eve was his wife. Everybody comes from them. Tower of Babel was a literal uh, event that happened. That's why we had the confusion of languages. Noah's flood, Noah's ark was, you know, um, as, as plainly written. Uh, that's where the fossils come from, these types of things. And so this was common knowledge. Not just simply with Christian theologians, but with the average Christian and even the population in general, uh, the Christianized West, um, Webster's Dictionary, it just reiterated exactly what the Bible says. So when you hear people saying things like, oh, well, you know, um, young earth creation is just a, like it's a modern uh, approach to, to Genesis. That's absolutely falsehoods. And they really need to do their, their homework and not just accept uh, what their Bible college professors and, uh, and and many theistic evolutionary organizations are saying. Well, Calvin, I really appreciated your biblical analysis of Adam and Eve, and I never would have thought to look at the dictionary of all places to see that 
Well, hey, like if you look at these older sources, older resources, and I'm sure maybe you could even do like the same thing with older encyclopedias, right? You know, where it just shows this was how the church has always looked at the scriptures. It's actually the uh, evolutionary creation or theistic evolution. That's the newer ideas that are coming in. As a matter of fact, like I would really challenge Christians to just sit there and go, okay, if I was just on a desert island and there was a Bible there, and I had no input from the secular scientific community. Would you ever, ever come to the conclusion that God used billions of years of evolution to create? It, it, just, it just would not come into your mind. It's not a biblical position. It's extra biblical, right? It, all those ideas come from outside the scripture. You know, actually speaking of, you know, embracing evolution, there are, you know, people who are sincere. They will embrace evolution. They, they still have a, a profession or a faith in Christianity. But what I've always found interesting, though, is that the impression that I get from, say, an atheist or an agnostic or a strictly naturalistic scientist is that the evolutionary theory is the death knell of Christianity, not something that Christians should embrace. There's a person's name is Francisco Alayla. They're an evolutionary biologist, and they said that Darwin was able to explain design without a designer. And he said that it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the destructive organization of living beings can be explained as the result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. So, Calvin, do you see evolutionary creation as an idea that will lead people to embrace Christ Jesus? Do you see evolutionary creation as something that will make it easier to embrace strict naturalism or something else entirely? Basically, what are the implications, if there are any, of accepting evolutionary creation? I'd like your listeners to consider something, whether you believe in evolution or, or whatever. You know, I, I think it's pretty hard for the even the average Christian right now to not see the absolute, you know, plethora of different um, Christians, former Christians, however you, you know, you figure that out theologically, but people who used to make confessions of faith in Christ. And I'm talking some pretty heavy hitters. I'm talking pastors that we know of. I'm talking theologians that we knew of uh, to, to, to just, you know, Bible bro, YouTube guys that have, uh, you know, apostatized. There's just been so many lately, right? Hillsong, you know, people and, and all this stuff that used to claim Christ as their savior and now declare atheism, right? Now, I wrote an, uh, an article um, just a, a little while ago called uh, Postmortem on the Apostate. And what I pointed out is this. Okay, so you've got all these people, they used to conf confess Christ as their savior for many, many years. And now they declare atheism. Okay, how do you go from here to here? What, what, what are the steps that you would need to take if, if, you know, if you or I were to say, yeah, you know, we're Christians, but now I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. Okay, so what the article explored is this. What are the fundamentals of the atheistic faith? Like, what do all atheists have to hold to if they're intellectual at all, if they're thinking? And, of course, you know, uh, they're not a monolithic group, just like many others. Uh, but there are some things that they must hold to. Okay, so here's the three things that all atheists must hold to. Number one, they have to believe in some kind of evolution. They don't have a choice because they have to explain how they got here without God. What's the only game in town? Some form of evolution. Now, I understand there's different kinds you know, there's punctuated equilibrium, there's Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinian theory, chaos theory, whatever you think, you believe that everything made itself, so to speak. So you have to believe in some kind of evolution. Second thing you must believe in is the concept of billions of years of Earth history. You don't have a choice because evolution can't take place quickly. That's called creation. <laughs> so you have to believe in billions of years to be an atheist. Third thing you have to believe, all atheists have, would have to believe, is that you can't take the Bible as plainly written. I mean, if you don't believe in God and the Bible is supposed to be the word of God, you don't look at the words in the Bible and say, well, what it plainly says then is true, right? So these three things are the fundamentals of the Christian, or, or sorry, of the atheistic faith. Now, here's the thing. I find that 
the average young person growing up in a Christian home, going to state-run schools, believe all three of those things by the time they're 13. And all theistic evolutionists believe all three of those things. See, if you believe the Earth's billions of years old, you go to school and they tell you about Earth being billions of years old, radiometric dating, all this kind of stuff, then you obviously don't take the Bible as plainly written because you say, well, the six days, they have to be millions of years old, blah, 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 blah. And if you're going to accept secular interpretations of geology, why wouldn't you accept secular interpretations of biology? So the theistic evolutionist is ripe for apostasy. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there are people, that the Christians who believe in evolution, that aren't truly saved. Yeah, they're, they're truly saved. If they've accepted Christ as their Savior, that's the requisite for, for, for salvation, etc. But what I'm saying is, if you see someone move from here as a, a professing Christian to an atheist, okay, and they already believe the fundamentals of the atheistic faith, there's not much of a, all, all you do is you just abandon this and you already believed all of this anyway. So as, as, as much as theistic evolutionists, you know, whinge about biblical creationists and say, oh, well, these young people, they're going to abandon their faith because they're going to, if you teach them biblical creation and then they find out the, in evolution and then, no, no, it's actually the other way around. Me growing up as an atheist, it wasn't until I had solid scientific explanations against evolution in favor of what the Bible said that I was even willing to consider uh, biblical creation. So just understand that what the public school system is teaching right now, what the state schools in the West are teaching is atheism because they teach naturalism. And if you as a Christian accept, well, you don't take the Bible as plainly written, then you already believe all three things that all atheists must believe. So theistic evolution is not helping the church, in my estimation. So I really think that those implications of theistic evolution that you outlined, they're really fascinating. And there's one more that I'd like to look at. So another interesting implication of evolutionary creation would seem to be that it requires or that it necessitates the theological belief that design is not or would not be detectable in nature. In his book, The Language of God, Francis Collins said, If God is outside of nature, then he's outside of space and time. In that context, God could, in the moment of creation of the universe, also know every detail of the future. Thus, God could be completely and intimately involved in the creation of all species, while from our perspective, limited as it is by the tyranny of linear time, this would appear a random and undirected process. So basically what I'm gathering from this quote is that in the evolutionary creation position, one can't detect design in nature. So Calvin, is this a biblical position? Does the Bible teach that humans can recognize design of God in nature? Yeah, that, uh, I'm familiar with that quote. And I'm actually familiar with the fact that that was an online debate or a written debate between Collins and Richard Dawkins. And uh, I encourage your listeners to look that up because Dawkins' response to that quote that, that Collins gave was, was pretty scathing. <laughs> and actually, I think Dawkins got the better. Uh, he scored more points uh, in his response. But anyway, okay, so the concept is that, you know, God's outside of, uh, of nature, so therefore you can't detect him in what? He created. Um, but that, that's kind of silly because, you know, if you, you know, did some kind of lunar landing or flew to Mars and there was a car there, uh, you could probably detect that there was the designer of that car that just happened to be on Mars, even if you didn't know the designer. But aside from that type of argument, let's go to what the Word of God says. In Romans 120, explicitly states for his invisible attributes. Okay, so you can't see God, but his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Romans 1.20 makes the explicit statement that no human being will die stand in the presence of God and say, there was no evidence of you. 
And what does it actually say? It says the evidence is the things that have been made. What God made is evidence that there's a creator. What God created is the evidence of the creator. So um, that, that statement by Collins is completely false according to God's word. Amen. And Calvin, speaking of biblical teachings, in your video episode of Creation Basics, How Has Compromising the Creation Count Her the Church?, You said a brief look at the most popular compromise views in the order they were first introduced reveals a disturbing trend. Each new view drifts further from the straightforward meaning of Genesis 1, whether it's gap theory, historic creation, the age theory, progressive creation, the framework hypothesis, or theistic evolution, in their desire to adopt the idea of millions and billions of years, adherence to each of these positions must rearrange events described in Scripture. So, Calvin, when reading the Bible, particularly Genesis 1, since that is the text that is in question, what are some guidelines that Christians should follow in order to arrive at or to ascertain the true purpose or the true meaning of the text? You know, we're we're having a conversation right now. People are listening to our conversation, and you know what they're going to do is they're going to attempt to take our words as as we speak them plainly, right? And so that concept, just it's just intuitive, right? We're speaking, we're having a dialogue, the things you say, the things I say, you take them as plainly written. And what I think that theistic evolutionists and long earth creationists and, and, and so on have tried to do, and as you mentioned, each one of the variations, you go from the gap theory to the age theory to theistic evolution, you know, it keeps changing a lot. There's all these different views. Is they keep going further away from the plain reading of the text. And what I've had Christians say is, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the entire Bible, there's poetic language, there's parables, you know, Jesus speaks in, in uh, parables and things like that. But you see, even a parable has a plain meaning. And we use this type of language all the time. So if I said to you, um, you know, Christopher, I'm as hungry as a horse. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Okay. Most of your listeners out there, if they're familiar with, you know, common English jargon, are not going to sit there and go, wow, Cal is so hungry. He's going to go out and and get a horse and he's going to eat it. Right. He even has the capability of doing that. I just mean I'm really hungry. <laughs> okay. If, if, if somebody says, oh, you know, uh, my, my girlfriend is my sun and my moon and my stars, you know, people aren't going to say, oh, you think your, your girlfriend is this huge orbiting thing out in space and, you know, this big ball of gas. And it, it's so common to just say, no, I, I get what you're saying. She, she's your everything. You're focused on her. She's just like, you know. And so, When you're looking at Genesis, when you're looking at any part of scripture, you should take it as it's plainly written. And my question to to theistic evolutionists and long earth creationists is, how come the church knew what it said for 1800 years until old earth theology or old earth ideas started to creep into the church? And then all of a sudden, nobody knows what it means anymore. Right. Because you talk to 10 different people and they say have 10 different ideas on what Genesis is. Is Genesis that hard to to, to understand? No, it's not. God did this on day one, did this on day two, did this on day three. It's just so easy to read. And then you get the summation in Exodus 20, 11. For in six days, the Lord created the heavens, the earth, the seas, all, all that's in them. Right. So I just encourage people, why would you take these these words Um, any other way than as they're plainly written, especially when we look in the New Testament and Jesus and the disciples, they just quote them verbatim as real history. There's no reason not to. There's an agenda there. The agenda is to somehow um, compromise and make evolutionary ideas fit with the Bible. It has nothing to do with, well, these people are really good scholars and, and this, that, and the other thing. Well, there have been some really good scholars throughout history, Archbishop Usher, John Calvin, Augustine, 
um, Luther. I mean, everybody's got their heroes, you know, and look at the way they're examining the Bible. Take it as plainly written. There's no reason not to take Genesis as plainly written. And if you don't, you do much damage to major Christian doctrines, including the gospel. And I think that's one thing that Christians don't understand. They think this is just a science debate. No, no, no. It affects the gospel message and it affects the gospel proclamation. And if they don't understand that, sometimes you have to get into more detail. But that's the biggest issue. If this affects the gospel, we shouldn't be taking these things lightly and just saying, oh, well, it's, it's, you know, you can believe the gap theory, you can believe this, you can believe that. Because by adding the concept of millions of years to the Bible, you actually attack the gospel message directly. That's incredible. And actually, we're going to get into that. We've now arrived at our final question. And there is an episode, it's the 100th episode of Creation Basics. You said... What does the God of an old earth look like? This is part two. The description says, Calvin further exposes the logical conclusions as to what the character of a God of an old earth, with all of its necessary death and suffering before Adam sinned, would look like. And it doesn't look like Jesus. So, Calvin, if the God of the old earth is not Jesus, can you tell the audience who exactly is Jesus. Yeah, and, and most Christians would know the answer to that, right? God, uh, Jesus is our creator. He's our redeemer. He's our savior. Um, he's our all in all. <laughs> we can start saying, um, you know, most people, most Christians have plaques on the wall and, uh, you know, who Jesus is, right? All the different names and things he's done for us. And he's our friend and he's our God and, and, and so on. You mentioned the character of God, and this is what I meant by if you add millions of years to the Bible. So whether you're an old earth creationist, whether you're a theistic evolutionist, okay, all other positions about Genesis, other than biblical creation, God created in six days around 6,000 years ago, introduces the concept of death before sin. And so that was what I was talking about in that episode of Creation Basics is, you know, where do you put billions of years into the Bible? The only logical place to put it is in the six days of creation, because then, you know, Adam and Eve come on the scene in whatever form you, you believe they come on the scene, right? They come on the scene. And then after that point, Adam sins and sin and death enter into the world, right? So, you know, we read Romans 5, 12, through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So, that whole you know grouping of passages in Romans talks about where sin and death came from. It's when the first man, Adam, fell. And the entire creation was corrupted because of that. And that's why we need a savior. We need Jesus as our savior. Now, the challenge is, is if you try to insert billions of years into the Bible, you have to put it into the six days of creation. And that's, you know, the gap theory started that. Well, there was a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and we stick the millions, billions of years there. And then you get, um, you know, day age theory or whatever. It doesn't matter what position it is other than biblical creation. You have to make the billions of years go into the six days of creation. Now, what are scientists saying are the evidence of billions of years? Initially, it had nothing to do with things like radiometric dating or, or ideas like that. It had to do with the rock layers, with the fossils. Right. And you'll hear evolutionists. I've, I've seen evolutionists wear T-shirts. We have the fossils. We win. <laughs> it's like we don't have fossils, too. Um, but see what they're saying. And this is the way I was described. It was described to me in school is when you see those rock layers, those finely laminated rock layers. Right. They would tell me that you might lay one or two of those barbs down per year. And if you add them all up, it must have taken billions of years to lay down these these tremendous layers of rock that we see in the Grand Canyon and stuff. And of course, you've got fossils embedded in there. And so this is supposedly the history of life on earth, blah, 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 blah. Well, the biblical creationist says, no, 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 that's the record of the flood, the judgment that God proclaimed. And that would be the result of it. Billions of dead things entombed in those rock layers, right? Which would make sense. Especially when you see some of these fossils, for example, things like, um, you know, 30 foot tall polystrate trees, for example, if you go to uh, Joggins, Nova Scotia, my wife is from Nova Scotia, and you can go to these famous fossil cliffs and you can see tree-like plants, 30 feet tall, extending through the sediments. 
Well, obviously, they didn't stand around for you know millions of years as the sediment slowly crept in. They were just washed into place and all that sediment got laid down. It didn't take millions of years. However, let's get back to our, our theological discussion. If you're saying that those rock layers got laid down over billions and billions of years during the six days of creation, which weren't days, and at the end of it, God pronounced all of his creation, very good. So anything that just happened was very good. Then Adam comes in on the, the scene and then Adam sins and then the fall happens. Well, what do we see entombed in the rock layers? We see lots of death, lots of suffering, animals killing each other. We see um, cancer in the fossil record. We see all sorts of different diseases in the fossil record. Um, so if you're telling me that God used billions of years of death suffering, cancer, um, survival of the fittest, you know, nature red in tooth and claw, so to speak, and then called it very good. You're saying that God says cancer is very good. And then Adam sins and then the fall happens. Well, what's the result? Death? Well, death's been happening for billions of years. And by the way, if God's going to restore the world to the way it was in the beginning, it was very good, but very good includes death and suffering and disease and cancer and all that stuff. What's God going to restore the world to? You see, it turns the Bible into a complete book of nonsense. What, what, what's Jesus saving me from? And by the way, some old earth creationists have said, well, no, no, no. It was just animals that were dying before the fall. Um, it was, you know, Romans 5.12, it's talking about men. Well, it, it most assuredly is. But you know that evolutionary scientists have now said that they've found fully human people like you and me, supposedly uh, almost 200,000 years old, and, and some of them were cannibalized. So they cannot even hide behind that anymore. You have to say, because 200,000 years, where are you going to fit that in the Bible? It has to happen before Adam sinned. So now you have to accept that humans were dying before Adam sinned, and some of them were eating each other, and God called all that very good. Well, in my estimation, that attacks the character of God in such a horrific way. And go, go talk to atheists, go talk to people, and, and, and they'll say, so you believe that your God used billions of years of death, suffering, cancer, all that stuff, bloodshed, people killing each other and eating each other, and he called it very good? And, and then Adam sinned? It, it, it just blows the gospel out the window. In, in my my estimation. And you talk to many people and they're just like, I don't, I don't want to worship a God like that. Why, why would we worship the God of cancer? Um, so that's not the reflection of who Jesus is. God created a perfect world. There was no sin, no death, no suffering, that, that type of thing, no you know, bloodshed and all that. Man rebelled against God and Adam fell and Eve fell and the seed of those two people were corrupted and we are a sinful race and we do wrong things, but we do it willingly. That's the problem. You know, right from wrong, you know, you know, God's written the law into your heart. You know, you shouldn't do these things, but you still do them. And so you will be judged for what you do. You know, when I first heard the gospel, I went to see a man uh, present and uh, I kind of knew him casually from business and I respected him and he all come to this non-denominational service. And I'd never been to church before. I showed up with a clipboard and a pencil. I was very, very skeptical. I thought he was going to be, you know, pounding the pulpit and shouting out Bible verses, things I'd seen on TV, but he actually did a very good job of giving a biblical defense and he attacked evolution quite effectively. Um, he had a medical degree and, uh, and, and so on, red origin of species. And I, I didn't get saved at that service, but I walked out of there really shaking my head going, wow, look at all these holes in evolution. And over the course of a year, I was thinking, well, if evolution is, you know, what, what it's all chalked up to be, what's the only option? God, right? And so a year later, I got invited to hear him speak again. And he did a good, good, you know, did some apologetics, but he also gave a good, clear gospel message. And he talked about sin and he talked about, you know, uh, God's law. And I really felt convicted because even though I professed atheism, I still, you know, didn't want people lying, but I lied and I didn't want people stealing my stuff, but I'd stolen things and, and so on. And he gave a good analogy. He said this, pretend when you come into being, uh, you know, uh, this invisible camera shows up and it starts recording everything you do, everything you say, all those things you do when you don't think people are around all those things. 
And when you die, you stand in front of God. And I was taking it kind of personally as he was saying this. So I was picturing myself, you know, standing in front of God and God saying, hey, Cal, how you doing? Um, hey, what we're going to do is take this, the, the, the DVD uh, out of this camera here and we're going to plug it in and sit down on this cozy, comfy couch and we're going to watch your life. So it's me and God sitting on a couch watching my life to see whether I was good enough to be with God in eternity. And, you know, in my mind, it was like a bad movie. And I was like, no, (laughs) I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't have wanted to do that with my mom, um, you know, knowing what I'd done in my life. And he gave this analogy, he said, but see, if you're a Christian, it would be like Jesus coming along at that point before God plays play and say, no, Father, play my DVD instead of my life and base your judgment on my life, the perfect sinless son of God as a substitution. And that was the first time I ever understood the gospel message, who Jesus was, why he came to do what he did, um, and and so on. And so I got saved, um, went home, I had a Bible, started reading it. By the way, guess where I started reading? Genesis, because it's a book. So I started at the beginning. I wasn't educated enough to start in, uh, I don't know, the gospel of Luke or something like that. And I went from, Okay, so, you know, evolution, millions of years, all this stuff to, well, God created. Okay, created in six days. And that's the renewing of your mind. This is what the Bible does. It reveals things to us, right, supernaturally. So it greatly confused me after I got saved that I encountered so many Christians that were willing to compromise, in in my estimation, on the Word of God and just taking it as plainly written because of an authority outside of Scripture. There cannot be. Uh, a, a higher authority than God and His Word. Amen. Thank you so much for your time, Calvin. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to search with us for the truth on Pilot's interview. You can find Calvin's biographical information, his social media, and the Answers in Genesis Canada YouTube channel in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Pilot's Interview podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.